Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer of Austin B Media, and I'm here today with uh, Nardeep Kermi and Pallavi Sastri. Apologies if I butcher your names. I'm not the great at pronouncing things, as anyone who has watched my real award ceremony has can attest to. It was brutal. Um, but uh, Nardeep Pallavi, uh, thank you so much for um, the for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Nardeep is the director, writer, and star of Land of Gold, and Pallavi is the producer of Land of Gold. Uh, correct me if I have that wrong. Um, and it's screening at Tribeca tomorrow, as of this recording, at 5.15 p.m., Wednesday at 3.45 p.m., and Thursday at 8.16 p.m., which I thought was awfully specific. I mean, I, I get like 3.45 <laughs> And 515, but 816, that was weird. Um, but those are all at Angelica if you can make it to uh, Tribeca. Um, I think you pay 350 or something like that, it might have increased. Um, and then if you're at home, you can do it through Tribeca at home uh, starting this Thursday at 6 p.m. I don't know if that's central, I'm betting that's Eastern um, based on how the Tribeca at home has worked. Um, and then for those who can't catch either, uh, either uh, any of those screenings. Uh, HBO Max, I believe, just uh, picked it up for distribution in the United States. Yeah, That's right. uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll know more about that within the year. So uh, yeah, if, you, if you miss it at the festival, you'll be able to catch it on HBO Max at some point soon. Yeah, they've been really uh, good at um, picking up stuff like that. I think they picked up Drive My Car last year. Which is an incredible yeah. movie, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. we're uh, very very fortunate and very lucky to be in such great company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, Nardeep, how would you describe this to anyone who isn't familiar with A Land of Gold? How would I describe it? Yeah, I would describe it as a a hopeful road trip drama that's going to make you feel empathy uh, towards your fellow man. Um, Land of Gold is uh, the story of Kieran, a uh, Punjabi American truck driver who's expecting his first child and is absolutely terrified about that. Mm -hmm. And he takes one last long haul drive before his child is due and discovers Elena, a 10 year old undocumented American stowed away in his trailer. Uh, so the movie is this road trip uh, drama, uh, which becomes a surrogate father's uh, daughter story between this man learning to be a father in the moment and this young woman who's desperately trying to find her last remaining family member in America. Um, bring a box of tissues. <laughs> so what I hear you saying is I should watch this in the back of a car and, and just have somebody drive me somewhere for like two hours and just bring a whole setup like a monitor and everything, just tissues on one side, monitor over to the left. And I'm like, hey, hey, as long as someone else is driving, yeah, do it. Yeah, That's yeah. Actually... I was gonna say I get concerned about the driver. They they would probably be very very worried about you in the back seat there. <laughs> That's actually how I watched Drive My Car because I had put it off for so long, and I think it was um, I think it was on the Spirit Awards. Uh, I think I had to vote for it, uh, but I didn't catch it, so I caught it on. I either rented it or I I don't know how I saw it. Uh, it's been so long, and I've seen at least 90 movies since then. Um, but yeah, it, it, uh, I'd be interested to see this in a car, actually. But obviously, <laughs> anyone who's thinking about doing that, don't drive and look down at your phone. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so um, humor aside, where did the uh, idea for the film originate? Sure. Uh, so I uh, was doing a bunch of research on uh, a myriad of different things, and I came across this sort of unknown history um, between Punjabi Americans and Mexican Americans in the early 1900s during the Asian Exclusion Act. And that started inspiring me about telling an intersectional story between the two communities since they've got so much history in America already. Um, and around that time, I had a lot of friends who were about to have their first kids, you know, Paul V being one of them. Um, and I was asking questions about what was that feeling about becoming a parent like? And specifically towards uh, a lot of the men, when did they feel like they were becoming a father? Was that at, like while the pregnancy was happening? Was that after they met their child for the first time later? 
And um, it started making me think about the sort of first generation experience that we have and how we kind of have to move on from our parents' immigration story or parents' traumas to kind of be the parents that we want to be in America. And um, that coupled with the headlines, these stories of these undocumented children that were just trapped in these cages at the border, uh, I couldn't get those images out of my head. Um, that kind of all went into the soup and um, blended together to make Land of Gold. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's such a, uh, going back to your description of it, it's such a multifaceted um, story because I, I heard somebody on an interview, um, oh, I, I forget which interview it now, was now because I think this is my ninth or 10th interview out of Tribeca, so it's easy to get my wires crossed, but he described his film as just layers peeling back uh, the further and further you get into it. And I think that would probably be a good way to describe the film um, because I think it's never just one thing. It's all these dynamics and how they play together. Um, and Flavi, uh, so you're the producer of the film. Um, it's a cliche question, but I thought I'd ask it anyway. But um, what drew you to Land of Gold as a producer? Yeah, um, uh, it's it's Pallavi, and oh, uh, yeah, no worries, no worries. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, I, I'm a producer on the film, uh, but I'm also in the movie, and so that is a very big um, evolution of how all of this happened for us. But um, Nardeep came to uh, my producing partner and I, Kirtana, who also happens to be my sister. And as he mentioned, um, you know, I was becoming a parent for the first time. And so when I actually heard his um, vision for what the story was, and it wasn't even really written yet, he had just like had all of his notes down. It wasn't a, a full script yet. And he talked about it with us over dinner. Um, and I was about four and a half months postpartum when we had that conversation. Um, so there was a lot of things that he was talking about that were resonating because they were fresh for me. Um, and, you know, I just kind of jumped in and I said, this sounds great, write it, send it to us. And I would love to see where this goes. And, you know, he sent us like what we call the vomit draft, um, which is like, you know, he just wrote everything down. It was, you know, so, so long and like he hit period. And then, you know, the end sent it to us. There was like grammar things going on everywhere. <laughs> we were like, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what we were looking for was really strong bones and like what was the why did he write this and like what he told us in that dinner was on the page so we were like oh everything else we can figure out um and so I just I said you know I think I I would really love to offer whatever I have um to this and then it sort of turned into me playing creepy the wife yeah and on that same note um I kind of want to dig into the relationship between Kieran and Elena um Nardi, uh, how did you want to portray that relationship um, given, the, I, I guess I'll just leave it there, at there. How did you want to portray that relationship? Yeah, are oh, you trying to trying to ask some, some, some deep question there? Uh, no. Uh, I try. I, I want, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I wanted it to be an odd couple. Um, I really wanted it to be two characters coming from completely different perspectives and they think they're coming from completely different perspectives, butting heads. Um, uh, not seeing eye to eye, and then the onion unlayering kind of thing uh, is, is apt. As the onion starts to get, you know, peeled, uh, they realize they have more similarities than they do differences. Um, so it's a surrogate father-daughter story, uh, but it is ultimately just like a, this really beautiful friendship that forms between this, you know, this, this young man and this young woman who make each other better. And, and help each other through some of their most intense traumas that they're dealing with um, to be happy, well-adjusted people. Um, you know, I, I've always loved stories of odd couples who kind of band together to be better. And um, uh, I thought that would be like a really delightful way to kind of approach the story and the relationship between the two of them. Yeah, for sure. And um, here's another deep question for you because I just know you love these. Um, Lay it on me. What did you want to say about the practice of the other in this film? 
um, narratively. The practice of the other? Yeah. Mm. In white America, I, um, I know yeah. you talked yeah. a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Intersectionality. Uh, totally, yeah. Um, and Paul, if you chime in, uh, please. So what I, one of the things that I was really interested in exploring is the spaces we exist in. So as hyphenate Americans, people who aren't white BIPOC folks, you know, even LGBTQ folks or whatever, we often live in different spaces where there's the space that we feel comfortable in our homes, where we are with our friends and our families, that we feel safe and we can be ourselves. And we often have to code switch uh, in other places uh, just to kind of survive. And I think that's something that I was really kind of keen on exploring in the film, particularly through the relationship between Elena and Kieran, was where do they feel safe and that they can be themselves and they can be vulnerable and they can hurt and laugh and be joyful together. And then where do they have to put that veneer up? Where do they have to put that guard up? And Elena being 10, not really understanding where those moments are because she just wants to be herself all the time. And Kieran is wrapped up in that trauma of having to keep a veneer up the entire time, which is the major reason why he's holding back on being the husband he can be to Preeti and the father. Um, so yeah, I think that is one of the things that I was interested in exploring, the spaces that we as, you know, brown folk uh, uh, want to be in and, and feel comfortable in. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's also, in, in a, I'll chime in or piggyback on that into right. saying like, going inside of those places that we don't always get to explain like we have to over explain just to like get people to understand so we just end up not sharing at all like for example inside of a church or inside of a gurdwara inside of a Punjabi specific truck stop where like it's very just comfortable you know inside the truck you know it's just like actually showing the spaces and exist those people exist existing in those spaces um and to just kind of normalize it without having to over explain it yeah, and um, a similar thing, it's not related to this film, but um, I think a good companion uh, if for those who are watching uh, at home um, would be, I know there's a documentary, um, an act of worship. I think that would make a great companion piece for that because uh, that film, uh, which I haven't seen as of this recording, um, is about, um, um, I, I don't know the exact terminology, but um, Muslim uh, Americans uh, who, who were born post 9-11 having to deal with the uh, ramifications of public perception of just, you know, existing, as you say, you know. Um, so if anyone wants a good companion piece, I think just based off of what you you people, uh, what uh, Nardeep and uh, Pallavi, uh, you've said, um, and apologies if I mispronounced that again. Um, That's okay. Um, I think that would make a great companion piece. Maybe just. I would agree yeah. with you. I would agree with you. Nosheen is a good friend, and and you know, Nosheen is the filmmaker who made that movie. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of uh, documenting. Uh, the last like day in the life, sort of slice of life stuff that they have to deal with in terms of the last 20 years of, of post 11 So you're, you're yeah. on the right track there. It's a really, really beautiful movie. If, if, if The people should definitely check it out. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this was a softball. I promise. I promise. Um, so what was most challenging about having to wear three different hats? You had to direct, you had to write, and you also had to star in this film. Uh, most challenging, keeping my sanity. <laughs> I think that was, that's the most challenging, keeping my sanity. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's funny. You asked that question. A lot of people ask that question. It really wasn't that difficult for me on this set. Um, Pallavi, Kirtana, our, our other producer, Simon, they helped build an, the perfect environment for me to be able to do all of those things and wear all those hats, right? Uh, they gave me the time, they gave me the space to do the work. You know, we surrounded, 
we surrounded ourselves with like the best crew we possibly get. Like my cinematographer, Chris Lowe and I have known each other for 15 years. So like in terms of directing visuals and stuff like that, it's easy street because we've known each other for so long, right? Um, our line producer, Julie Persani is again, one of my best friends. And, you know, we knew that the set operations and things would run really, really, really great. I, you know, we had an acting coach, Kate Kugler on set. So I knew the performance would be fine. Um, and with me and, and with Caroline who plays Elena, uh, we had an incredible crew in Oklahoma. Like, you know, we're really um, uh, wanted to live by our example. So inclusivity was really important to us and is important to us. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have the most inclusive set possible. So we hired local Oklahomans. We gave people their first jobs um, or as heads of department and everyone killed it. We even got to work with the Cherokee Nation on the film wow. in, a, in a really beautiful way. Um, you know, uh, and that's that's a testament to the producing unit and to what all of the and, and the rest of the team did and provided for me. Like, it, it, it was challenging because it was a, you know, a five-week shoot. But <laughs> that five-week shoot allowed us to make the magic that, you know, hopefully people will see on screen. Um, so, yeah, just, yeah, it could be my sanity. Yeah, that's that, that would probably be it. Yeah, just sanity. Yeah. I mean, the anxiety is, like, bound to go through the roof at times. But, like, you know, I think it's, like he's saying, if we were like our, our main concern, we, what well, we asked him, we were like, what is it that you need? And we were like, this, there's a lot going on. And there's a lot of moving parts. And he actually just like, he asked for a very, like a big thing, but a simple ask, right? Like he was like, I just need time. Cause I need to do, I want to do the coverage I want. And I was like, okay, time is the thing. It's not the money. It's not the toys. It's not the, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he wasn't asking for any of that. It was time. And I was like, okay, so how do we schedule so that his anxieties don't go through the, go through the roof and our anxieties go, don't go through the roof. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and um, my Bowery interview, which I think is out now, I think it's hard to keep track of these things. Um, they talked about, it's a co-director team. Uh, there's two directors on that. And they talked about just the relief of having, okay, I can go talk to this to who I need to about this thing because I know this uh, my other director has it you know um which is kind of an interesting insight you know I wouldn't think about that but um anyways uh Nardi Pallavi uh thank you so much for joining me today I I appreciate taking your time so early I mean it's <laughs> probably what eight o'clock ten o'clock there Oh, yeah, we're it's, good. it's like 10 o'clock. Come on. We had breakfast. We got some yogurt. We're good. We're good, boss. Well, good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Austin. <laughs> thank you.